Hi, Misha here, and late in 2023, Century Arms of all people imported a batch of Carabiner Car 98Ks, Kurs. And these are true original Obendorf Mauser production, complete with banner on the side. And they're from 1941, so wartime. And they have Waffen amps and other wartime markings. And they have a really neat crest because these were actually part of a Portuguese contract. Portugal would ultimately use roughly 150,000 K98Ks bought before and during the war. And this would be their standard bolt-action rifle into the early Cold War period. And for people who missed the boat on the early East European K98s and then the later Russian capture K98s, this might be the next kind of import wave because it's legitimate. And the majority are in pretty good shape. The majority have at least mostly matching numbers. The import mark's in a good place. The bore, at least the one I got, is in good shape. Even came with a leather sling. It also has capture screws, cleaning rod, sight hood that has it all been plundered out. Mechanically solid. And these even were imported with bayonets. I didn't buy the optional bayonet. I'll explain why at the end of the video. And they even were imported with a few cases of 8mm Mauser surplus ammo. So it's kind of an all-in-one thing. In this video, we're going to go over the, the history, how the K98K came to be itself, and how Portugal came to select it. Because originally, they actually were leaning towards the 303 infield, of all things. So why did they pivot and switch over to the 8mm? Why did they side with Nazi Germany in World War II? These and other questions will be answered in this rather in-depth video, because once you ask me about military surplus, CNR guns, I can't help myself. And I'm not an expert on Mausers, so when I get things wrong, I apologize in advance. And with that, if you could, on your end, like, share, and subscribe, that would be great. And if you'd really like to help support us, check out the link to Patreon and or jo join us on a live stream, because really the reason I decided to go ahead and do this video is a couple of people had asked on a recent live stream before Thanksgiving. So, hey, it's a topic, it's timely, but what isn't timely is the Model 98's history. So let's go back 125 years where it all began. During the Great War, Imperial Germany, under the Kaiser, used two patterns of Mauser, both based on the 98. You had the full-size Gewehr 98, or G98, and the quote-unquote carbine Carabiner 98, Car 98, sometimes abbreviated to K98, although not really correct. Also sometimes called Car 98 AZ, that's sort of correct. We'll get into that in a minute. And we're just skimming here because this is really just to provide context for our Portuguese subject today, but hey, why not? Who doesn't like talking Mausers? The standard Gewehr 98 infantry rifle. Really the Model 98 was the culmination of Paul Mauser's design. Of course adopted officially, or at least created officially in 1898. It would start to see limited field issuance in 1901 and widespread production and adoption in, by 1904. And initially fired the original 8mm round nose projectile but in 1903, the prototype of the 7.9 or 7.92 Spitzer bullet came out, and it was tested and put into the field by 1905, which required a slight adjustment. So this was very much in service before World War I. In fact, when the war kicked off, Germany had over two and a quarter million of these already in its inventory. So what do we have here? Well, it's a full-size rifle with 
about a 29 and a quarter inch barrel. Semi pistol grip stock. Interesting detachable rear sling swivel taken from the 88 rifle. It can actually be moved here. That's why there's a hole in the trigger guard. Unique to this pattern, or at least at the time, was this like quarter or third upper hand guard with the front and the rear of the barrel exposed, bottom sling mount, bayonet lug, you know the deal. And of course this tangent or roller coaster, or so I should say lange, sorry, roller coaster rear sight. Pretty identifiable as a Great War Gewehr 98. And this is what they call, of course, a large ring receiver or mauser. This is relevant to the Portuguese, I promise. And of course the famous Mauser bolt system. Flipping it over, you notice a straight bolt handle. No finger grooves, grasping grooves in the stock. And you notice a stock disc. And you'll notice there is a hook, sometimes called a parade hook, here. There was a front sight protector used, but it was more of a removable cover piece, not like we'd see later. Sectional cleaning rod, you know the deal. Five shot internal magazine. And by World War One, yeah, they would all be firing in, in the German military, the 7.9. There was actually a program, I believe it was the Danzig Arsenal, that updated older examples to the newer standard. And I should mention that 11 arsenals and factories in Germany would build these state and private and like I said they had over 2 million before the war during the war they built roughly 7 million bringing the total to about 9 million with most of the production being 1915, 1916 by 17 and 18 they actually slacked off and focused on machine guns infantry rifle good but a carbine was needed for the artillery, cavalry, and others. I'm not going to lie to you, one reason I'm doing background on this video is it lets me talk about two of my favorite Mauser variants of all time, and this is the first one, the Kirbiner, the Car 98. Obviously it is a shortened form but in a lot of ways it's different and it has an interesting genesis the idea actually goes back to the around 1899 so right after the 98 was adopted a short form was felt necessary for cavalry and artillery and they actually were going to do two they were going to do a bayonet lug version for cavalry and no lug but stacking rod version for artillery and originally, it was to have and did have a barrel about 17 and 3 quarters inches, giving it an overall length of under 38 inches. It was adopted in 1902 and put into limited production. Interestingly, these would only ever be made at the four state arsenals, never privately by like DWM or Mauser. And the original carbine version, either one, worked okay with the initial round nose 8 millimeter bullet but once the 7.9 spitzer bullet came in already by 1904 1905 they were noticing that under 18 inch barrel gave a hell of a lot of flash sound recoil and was just generally unpleasant so field trials to try to figure out what to do were well underway by 1906 and it was decided to stop production of the initial car 98 with the really short barrel only about 20 maybe 25,000 were built and I'd love to have one but I don't but we have the next best thing here including why it was called the car 98 AZ by 1907 trials for a new carbine were underway and it was decided why have two production models we can just have one so let's combine the bayonet lug and stacking rod and this is actually where the name 98 AZ comes from essentially lug and rod the thing is that was really only ever applied to the 
trials version because more than one mod was in the trials once it was adopted in 1908 it was simply adopted as the carbine model 1898 the car 98 so why does car 98 az get repeated well it seems to be a bit of a misnomer or misinterpretation in a uh, john uh, john walter's book but you know once something gets it's, it's it doesn't really matter but i just wanted to point that out that according to german records it, it's just the uh, the car 98. anyway just wanted to clear that up what is it overall length is a little under 43 inches and we have a 590 millimeter barrel so about 23 and a quarter inches long so longer than the original carbine but still shorter than the other one obviously no cleaning rod we have a protected front sight we have a full length handguard we have a new tangent flat adjustable rear sight we have these grasping grooves that would appear during the war as were they on the full rifle the takedown disc for the stock would appear on the full rifle during the war but unique to this we have this pass-through side sling mount we also have a dished out area for a turn down bolt interestingly it's a half bolt and it's checkered on the underside still the same five round mag but this is not the same receiver other side of the sling mount of course side mount for strapping across your back but back to the receiver note there's no step in it is on the original one here this is a so-called large ring this has the earlier style i guess we'll call it retroactively small ring that was done to save on weight also to save on weight the barrel has a new tapered profile it's a lighter weight barrel in addition to being shorter a few other things they did they actually shortened the stock and they moved the trigger guard it's actually in a different location this will be important for later too i promise little changes that again don't immediately jump out at you but it did mean a lot of the parts and even some of the tooling was not immediately interchangeable nevertheless it was a great carbine for world war one and most of these were produced during the war and they would build about one and a half million by the time of the armistice and of course that would lead to the treaty of versailles so 1919 would see the end of imperial germany and of course the treaty of versailles would put a lot of weapons restrictions in fact ultimately the only factory officially allowed to build new firearms in germany in the 1920s was simson a jewish owned factory as it would happen which would definitely not lead to problems a decade later anywho it also restricted the number of guns that the uh, weimar republic could have and then when it came to pistols it did a lot with barrel length when it came to rifles it really set a moratorium on how many gewehr 98s full length infantry rifles could be had these are considered the more offensive weapons you know long range this is at a time when smokeless powder was still emphasized for its range and deadly accuracy on the other hand it didn't restrict carbines as much they were still restricted but more were allowed for because of border security police railway defense heck even postal defense things of that nature so once they had enough gewehr 98s that they couldn't have any more they turned to carbines and of course they had car 98s but 1922-1923 this was retroactively designated on paper as the car 98 a and this is the reason why my second favorite mauser of all time to talk about in this video we had the car 98b these would be built 
Beginning around 1924, running through around 1930-31 at Simpson, they would do about 70,000 or so. And if it looks like the Gewehr, the G98, you would be correct. This was really a carbine only on paper. And it's actually very different from the 98A. For one thing, it's a traditional large ring 98 action, not the smaller ring. And the way the bolt's done is different. Yeah, we'll get into that. But generally, it still has the same long barrel. All that good stuff. And of course, it still fires 7.92 Mauser. So yeah, this was the car 98B. Sometimes also called the Gewehr 98B, or just Model 98, Car 98A, and then there were still older Gewehr 98s in limited numbers in the very small Weimar military. The 98B did have a few carbine features and a few improvements from the wartime example. Quite noticeably, it borrowed the side sling mount and passed through on the stock from the A. Typically, these would have walnut stocks, although during the war, you also saw beech wood. And you'll notice because of the side mount, that parade hook is now gone in the front, and even the hole on the trigger guard is gone because that QD mount in the rear is, you know, missing. Otherwise, they say here, but really, the rear sight is the most important thing. We're going to this flat tangent rear sight, essentially a longer version of the one featured on the A. And the thing is, while this Lange sight, this roller coaster sight, honestly is cool, its lowest setting was 400 meters. Remember, this is the era when they thought these things were meant for long range pinpoint shooting. It wasn't the most durable compared to some others, it could be knocked and adjusted. Of course, it stood up very tall. And because of the way it was attached and everything, it tended to heat up and shift around and everything during recoil. Going to this style, it was more separate and just a thinner metal. It didn't heat up as much from the barrel. It was cheaper to produce. Even fully out, it um, still didn't stand up as far. Just a more modern style sight. And you start to see much closer in increments for shooting with these as well. And of course too, the B had the turn down bolt handle with the notch and the stock for it. But it's actually a full sized knob, not the half knob from the A. And the trigger guard is not moved and the stock is normal. So. Very straightforward conversion. There was also an interim model, usually informally called the Gewehr 98M or G98M, where they took these but removed the rail coaster sight and gave them the newer flat tangent sight. So you saw that as, an, as a marked improvement. And it also gave kind of a common sight picture. The Car 98A, though, was a dead end. They really wouldn't be produced post-war, just using what they had. There would be some built in Poland, but other than that, it was kind of the end of things. Mostly, I think, because of the small ring receiver and reshaped trigger guard, it was just too different. But the 98B, even though it was kind of done to obfuscate a treaty, kind of showed the path forward. But it would take a while, because Simpson could only produce what it would. Mauser was uh, really limited. And DWM, they would continue on for a while. But by 1929, they would actually split off their firearms division. And while they would continue making ammunition and other things, they would stop making guns by 1930. So, what about the interwar Mausers? The Great War really showed the utility in a universal short rifle. The US and Britain really led the way, 
but other nations would follow. We even started to see it with Germany a bit when they consolidated carbines into one model. And since Germany wasn't really able to export and fulfill the demands of new nations and South American nations and everything, two factories stepped up. The new Czechoslovakian Bruno factory, using a production line obtained from Germany, and FN Herstel in Belgium, which had actually been partnered with uh, DWM and Lou before that, as far back as the 1880s. Each would make a short rifle, model 1924. This is the Czech one, of course, the VZ-24. They are different, but they're very similar. And this is really kind of standardizing. Using the 590 millimeter barrel from the 98A, but in other ways, adapting this for more multi-purpose, flexible use, general use, that's why it has bottom and side sling mounts. It has the flat sight, full length upper handguard on this one, protected front sight. And early on, these inner war guns had straight bolt handles because again they were more intended for general infantry use and at the time common wisdom was that a straight handle was uh, was better. Both FN and Czechoslovakia were very successful and this kind of got Mauser thinking. As early as 1924 they made their own variant based on the Gewehr 98 but with the shorter barrel and it was known as the Model 1924, but very few were produced because of the situation. So it was mostly just an experimental trials and test gun for a time. But in 1932, political winds were changing. The Treaty of Versailles was less important. And, of course, in 1933, everyone's favorite Charlie Chaplin impersonator came to power in his Nazi party. And at that point, they pretty much started using the treaty as toilet paper. And to be fair, with the depression happening around the world, it, everyone just kind of agreed to ignore it. And Mauser needed the business. They got tooling from BWM. For that matter, Simpson was seized by the Nazis and parted off, shut down which kind of left Mauser open to begin production, although for the first few years they were still doing it as clandestinely as possible. And thus we come to the model 1933. This isn't a model 1933 commercial Mauser, but it's close. And it's a good talking point here. The original 1924 was very similar to what else was going on. In fact, there was even a uh, Little long rifle and carbine version. The initial ones had straight bolt handles and bottom mounted sling swivels. The 1933 though introduced side sling mounts and the turn down bolt and cut out in the stock like the uh, 98B and just a few of the little tweaks and these were very high grade guns, very good fit and finish, good polish, commercial markings including the uh, Mauser logo. Some of these quote unquote commercial guns would have Mod 98 on the side but some would have the Mauser banner which actually dated back to before World War I. And the model 1933 was known as the standard model. That's what they were calling the universal rifle because Mauser's idea was they wanted to export these one size fits all for everyone. And the barrel is even a little bit longer. Whereas the 98A and the VZ24 had a, a 590, so roughly 23.2 something something, the standard model had a 600 millimeter barrel so 23.6 something something. You could say, well, a little more, you know, not quite half an inch. I think it's just because they wanted a round. I think the German uh, precision couldn't bear an uneven number. I think they just went to 
600 millimeters because it's a nice even. And I don't even know if I'm joking or not. You know, an interesting thing. And there would be one official German customer, the Postal Service. Postal inspectors, uh, regulators, that kind of thing. That was officially who they were made for, so much so that the Model 33 was often called the Postal Rifle. Some would also be required by the Railway Authority, the Railway Police, and a few sources, including Forgotten Weapons, also say that the, uh, the Border Guards, Border Security, had some. Also, unofficially and not surprisingly, many made it over to the SA, the brown shirts, and eventually the SS would get some too. But this is very much under the table, because in 1933-34, when these were being put into production, it um, really wasn't something talked about. In fact, when Mauser was doing full production in 1934, they were originally assigned the code S, which was supposed to stand for Simpson. This would be changed to S42, still kind of pretending like there's Simpson. And they would even mask the production date. Uh, 1934 was K, I believe, and 1935 was G, I believe. So they were coding this, but again, they, being Germans, they had to be precise, but they also wanted to kind of not fully admit that, hey, Mauser's making guns when it was supposed to be Simpson. So they, they played kind of fast and loose with the rules. But the 1933 standard Mauser, also because it was called the Banner Mauser, because of the banner that would appear on the side, was very popular export. And they would not just do them in 7.92, they would also offer them in 7 by 57 and also even 7.65 by 53 Mauser, which Argentina was using and which started off in Belgium. So they would be in different calibers. A lot would be sent to China, where they would be produced as copied. Many to South America, and uh, some ended up in Portugal, which was another kind of relevant for this video. And more importantly, directly, many would end up in nationalist Spain and used during their civil war, as would Portuguese troops. Well, let's go ahead and f kind of finish this, the Carabiner 98K saga first. One of Dufur's promises to his people was to make Germany great again. Mga, mga. And part of that would be restarting its arms industry and supplying a new enlarged Wehrmacht. So in February of 1934, the Wehrmacht announced that a new standard issue all-purpose rifle was to be adopted. Obviously, they really tailored their requirements around the Mauser standard model, including the barrel length and even the rear sight, specifying 100 to 2,000 meter adjustments. One interesting feature they had was a last round hold open, which is easy to do, and Mauser had actually done it for several other earlier contracts, but some earlier guns didn't have these, especially the World War I, so of course you can easily re refit one in. That's funny, kind of interesting that was a requirement, but it does make sense. Mauser was not the only company to submit a prototype, but it was close. I believe the only other major competitor was J.P. Sauer and Son, and even then the rifles looked darn near identical, except for a little bit different stock and barrel hardware, barrel bands, that kind of thing. Either way, in June 1935, the Mauser Standard Model 1, with just a few alterations and mostly just standardizations because, again, the Standard Model could be built in a few different ways for the customer. Well, this one would be built for the German military, you know, made their way, like a Whopper. And it would be designated as the Car 98 K, K for curse. And really it was a Car 98B, but shortened from a uh, barrel of about 29 and a quarter to one of about 23.6. It was still a large ring, had the same style of turned down bolt, same style of rear sight, even the same 
half measure upper handguard, large ring, I think I already said that. Either way, you can really tell that it's not a 98A. And that really marks the end of this gun's service. Now some would be kept around for World War II, the ones that existed. By the way, the whole Treaty of Versailles and the reissuance during the Weimar is why you see these in several Lugers and other guns with the quote-unquote double dates that say 1920 on them. Even some later production ones would have it. There was actually a government property stamp to show that it wasn't stolen. But I digress. But if you don't like digressions, why are you here on a Mishiko channel video? <laughs> so yeah, the Car 98K was the new standard. And of course, they would build over 14 million. And they'd be produced by well over a dozen factories in World War II and be the true backbone of the Wehrmacht. And really, it's just a 98B, which itself was a slightly modified Gewehr 98. You can see a direct lineage. And others could too, including Portugal. And at last we come to the Portuguese contract Mauser, M941, or is it M9? 37B. We'll get into that. And the reason I gave history is honestly one of the reasons this is pretty exciting for people who missed out on earlier German Wehrmacht guns because it is identical for the most part. Same factory. So it, it, for what these go for it's not a bad way to get an unmolested example. And the one here is exactly as it came in. Sling cleaning rod, sight hood, and all. But this is actually from the third and final Portuguese Mauser contract. Let's go back up and talk about why they ended up adopting these at all. Because originally, they used totally different guns before and during the Great War. One of Portugal's main infantry weapons was the 1904 Vergaro in the uh, 6.5. They did actually try out the Model 98 Mauser as the Model 1901, but went with the Vigero. They also had some Steyr rifles, and they ended up using a lot of Lee Enfields from Britain during the war. So much so that in 1931, they considered making 303 their standard round, and even did a conversion mostly done, I think, by Parker Hale in uh, England of the Vergaro to the uh, 303, known as the Model 0431. Uh, but because of politics and other things, the British really didn't want them going to 303. So they pivoted to 7.928 millimeter and the Mauser. And you might wonder, well, why didn't they go with an FN or a Czech BZ-24. Well, they were very, if, um, very familiar, very cozy with Weimar Germany and later Nazi Germany and nationalist Spain under Franco. In fact, they would uh, send roughly 10,000 volunteers from Portugal to Spain to fight on the nationalist side during that nation's civil war. And at the same time, Germany would send several early Carabiner 98Ks and or standard models for use in the war. And this would be where Portuguese troops would first get exposed to the newer version and they, they just had a good relationship with the with the two nations. So it was really kind of a foregone conclusion once they decided to pivot towards 8mm and the Mauser that they would go ahead and contract with Mauser in Germany who was just recently starting to produce. And they needed the money so deals were good. One thing I should note with this gun here, it is dated 1936. That was the first year they started actually putting a year on them going away from the codes. Uh, the factory code is still S42. And this is a really good example of the first Portuguese contract known as the M937. 
while Portugal would update some of their 1904s to 8mm, naming them as the 1904-39, they needed a standard updated modern gun. So they needed it quickly. So they, need, they wanted 100,000 guns. And because they were in production at Mauser, full scale, by 1937, they would do two batches, 50,000 and 50,000, to be delivered ASAP. The first 50,000 were straight off the production line, same as going to the Wehrmacht, although these were still officially standard models. The second 50,000 were actually of a slightly updated, modified pattern that Portugal requested. Not the same as the VZ-24, but similar. They had dual sling swivels, bottom and side, and they had a somewhat similar front sight protector. This would appear in a couple of other Portuguese guns, including the uh, 0439. So these would be known as the M937A. So you have the M937 and M937A, two parts of the same contract. All of these would be dated 1937. They would all have high gloss blued finish, hardwood stocks. And uh, it's a little unclear with the first batch if they would have Mod 98 or the Mauser Banner on the side, like we'll see here. But the second batch definitely had the Mauser Banner, and they would all have the Portuguese crest on the top of the receiver and have the date of 1937, even though the final ones in the batches were delivered in 1938. Still pretty quick. And they would get their own serial blocks, A through E, with 20,000 guns per block slated. So, makes sense. Five blocks, do it, you know, keep things going. This was a different serial arrangement than what the Wehrmacht, what the, the Germans were using. So it does kind of stand out. And presumably, they were quite happy with them. Because in 1941, we get this model here. Be it the M19 or so M941 or M937 Bravo M39B. Let's talk about it. In July of 1941, Portugal came to an agreement with Germany slash Mauser for yet another batch of 50,000 rifles and they were to resume serial blocks F and G as full 20,000 blocks and then a half block of 10,000 in H. Again they had a different serial range and sequence and, and system from Germany so it really didn't get in the way. And since the war was happening the days of trying to do custom configurations, sling swivels, all that were over. These were just going to be exactly the same Car 98Ks as shipped to the Wehrmacht, only with slightly different receiver markings. But otherwise, they would be the same. As I said, the original 37s were straight off the line, including having no front side hood, high grade finish. And they would either have Weimar Republic markings, or later ones could have early Waffen amps. The Mauser Waffen amp would be 135, that was the inspector assigned there. So when you get to the next batch, that continues. You have the, the same Waffen amp with the same, well, Nazi markings, 135. And you have the same features. The only real difference, 1941 was the transition period between the straight and the cupped butt plate. So some of these contract guns would have one and some would have the other. They would have the front sight hood. Same blued finish, more of a wartime style. They would of course have uh, Portuguese serial marks on the parts. This is a German's. Some would also have Portuguese crests on the stock and even an X as a Portuguese inspector stamp, but all would have the Portuguese crest on top of the receiver. And again, the Mauser banner. Flipping it over to see here. 
There's the early one with the German markings. And this one here is mine I pulled out. This is one of my uh, Russian capture guns. But it's from the same era, but with a cup to butt plate. So I thought it would be in interesting. And so that's, that's kind of why these are attractive. They have Waffen amps. They're not pinged out. They've got a neat Portuguese crest. They're made at the exact same factory at the same time. For people who missed out on a World War II German Mauser, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty authentic. And they're in really good shape because Portugal really never used them in anger at all. And the first guns were delivered in October of 1941, right away. And they made it pretty much through the first block, F block, before there was any issues, any disruptions. But January of 1942, the German government made an emergency acquisition. And so they obtained some of the Portuguese contract guns that were in the factory going out to supply to Wehrmacht troops. This seems to have happened at the end of the F block because a couple of the guns that went to the German military have turned up with the F prefix serial. Mostly it ends up in the G block though. How many were rerouted? Uh, 10, 15,000 it, it, it a guesstimate. Again, mostly affecting the G block. And so they got their first 20, 25,000 pretty well sequentially, but it gets all muddled up here. In the 1942, they would actually end up getting their full contract. Mauser would extend the H block to a full series, and some other guns would be pulled back from the from the German army to fulfill the order. Long story short, by the end of 42, or maybe beginning in 1943, they would get their 50,000 guns, even if a couple of them might have been gently used and refurbished, and even if some were added in the H block to make up for the shortfall. There have even been reports of Portuguese contract guns in an I block, but I don't know much about that, so just thought I'd throw that out there. Most you see are F, G, or H. And there's really no way to tell if uh, a gun served in Germany briefly or full-time. There are some Russian capture guns with a Portuguese serial system, so some of them obviously went on to the Eastern Front. Again, some would have the cup to butt plate. As far as I know, these would all have 1941 dated receivers, although there might be a handful with 1942. Two. That's the thing about Mauser collecting or collecting in general. We do the best with the data we have, but as new import batches come in, new serials come up, as people share more data online, we, we learn, we, we grow. That's why maybe a book made in, say, 1985 was printed with the absolute best research available, but today is hopelessly outdated because so much more has been learned thanks to the fall of the Soviet bloc and also the easier access and more widespread information on the internet. Trust me, it sure beats the old-fashioned gun shows. At any rate, that would fulfill the final contract. And what do we call them? Based on what I've been able to kind of dig up, and this is anecdotal and I very well could be wrong, but it seems like initially they were known as M9 37B, following all along from 937A, which makes sense considering they were doing the same thing with serials. But retroactively, as inventories were taken in Portugal and collectors got involved, the name M941 gets applied more and more into the 50s and 60s into today. And that really seems to be based on the receiver date. Again, <clears throat> All guns from the first contract, be they 37s or 37As, had 1937 dated receivers. All guns from this, except for maybe a handful at the end, have 1941 receivers. So it does kind of make sense in a more modern mindset to kind of just go by those two years. For what it's worth, Portugal also obtained the final Luger pistols that Mauser turned out 
designating those as M943. So again, very close relation with Germany and Franco, which kind of makes sense considering where Portugal is located and you probably didn't have a whole lot of choice, but uh, I digress. Again, not a lot of variation in these. They were all made early enough in the war. You don't see any of the Kriegs model shortcuts. But the original 37s really were nice guns. The the Banner Mausers, the standard models, are kind of legendary. They were very pretty. The history behind them. When you get to the 1941 guns, this is definitely a, a wartime production. But that's not to say a bad thing. And as I said, that's why collectors like them. Aside from a crest on the receiver, maybe in the stock, and the extra X stamping in the slightly different serial ranges, this is not only a German World War II Mauser, it was actually made at the Obendorf factory. There's a lot of history and credibility there. And when these came in this year, they... Like I said, at least the ones I got. Cleaning rod, side hood. They do have the capture screws on the underside. And again, came with the leather sling. You could also get bayonets with these. And the Portugal did obtain bayonets, but they added a lot of money to get a bayonet. And the bayonets were kind of in rough shape, so I opted not to get one. And before that, years ago, we had these Russian con uh, Russian capture guns like this one here. People kind of poo-pooed these because they'd been refinished in one degree or another. That never had bugged me, especially for what these cost. This is the one I picked up as a shooter years ago. Plus, I wanted a mid-war gun. And this fills that same role. And since Portugal didn't use them, most of them really stayed in good shape. And they actually hung on to a lot of them. There's a report out there from the internet that shows that in the early 50s they had all 50,000 or near enough it didn't matter of the 1941 guns and then they had uh, a good chunk well over 80 nearly 85,000 of the original contract 37 slash 37 a guns I'm not breaking those down because the numbers are a little unclear again these are all estimates and just because something is supposed to be some way on paper doesn't mean, you know, once reality hits, things get messy, even for the Germans. And again, while some contract guns were returned to Portugal, some stayed in the Wehrmacht to the very end of the war, which is why they ended up having to make around 10,000 more to kind of fulfill the, the shortfall. So there, you can find some that did. But they're pretty darn neat for what they are with their own history. And just for what it's worth, the mechanics are standard Mauser. Hold open device on an empty, standard turn down, standard cutout stock. I believe these were made from walnut, at least the majority. Yeah, it's kind of both their curse and their blessing that there's not a whole lot new to talk about with these. I'm not the deepest Mauser collector. You've probably noticed I'm not the most knowledgeable on Mausers, but, you know, I can respect them for what they are. I can also respect Century Arms for the way they did these imports. You don't notice a big old import mark on the receiver. In the past, they probably would have just slapped it straight across the crest. They actually held back on these putting it not just on the barrel, not on the side, but actually on the underside of the barrel, right there, where it's pretty well obscured by the cleaning rod, at least a, a decent amount. And it's as small of a font as ATF will let you get away with. The ATF speci specifies letters have to be at least so deep in the metal and at least so large. So they are limited and what they can do. But where they're not limited is where they stamp it. And for once, Century did it really as good as they could have without hand stamping in a very out of the way place. Another small change they had to do per law 
they kept the original serial, but they had to add a suffix to it because the serial was already in the ATS serial registry, the serial database. When that happens, you have to create a new serial. Sometimes with Mosins, they would just make a whole new serial. But on guns like this, it's nice when they just do little suffix, so you feel a little bit of rough stamping there. Luckily, they didn't have to put the serial stamping on all the other parts, so the original serial is on everything else. And even this one's the original, it just has that little addition. Not something I'm sure we like, but it's something just we have to, you know, get along with. That serial system and the import mark was established in 1968 by the Gun Control Act, so it's actually older than probably me and most of you. At the end of the day, it's just something we have to make peace with. And if that's what we have to have to get surplus like this in, I'm cool with it. For what it's worth, the gun I got does have a nice bore for being 70 years old, 80. And I really have no gripes. No missing parts, no broken parts, just a little bit of honest storage wear, flat butt plate, stock disc, lug, sights. I mean, this is legitimate, guys. This isn't a contract gun. And you can call it 37A, or sorry, excuse me, 37B, or 41. I, at this point, I think either one's more or less correct. But what do you think? These aren't cheap, but compared to what matching, more or less unmolested, where Tom Mausers have been going for the last few years, they're definitely cheaper. And once this batch dries up, and there can't be that many, because originally there weren't that many made, I'm sure they'll go up. And I figured why not grab one. Plus, a couple of supporters, commenters said, hey, why not do a video on these Portuguese imports, since they're kind of timely and relevant. So, I just like talking Mausers. I mean, if you like short videos, that's not what we do. I'd rather be thorough, talk about the history, because that's really where this is cool. I mean, looking at the gun, it's just another Carabani 98 Curse. But the interest is in the details, at least to me. What about you? So what do you think? Do any of you own a 9 37 or more, maybe even more interestingly a 937a that'd be kind of cool to have one of those because it was the one unique one out of the uh, out of the batches if not i thought this one was a good you know stand in because the first ones were just pulled from the same production lines what do you think of this one do you think it's in uh, good shape but uh, do, do you not like it um yeah let's just uh kindly discuss why not Overall, I'm pretty well, pretty well happy with it, guys. But then sometimes I'm easy to please when it comes to mill syrup. I won't lie. I'm just happy to see anything new. And it's been a while since we've had decent Mausers that weren't kind of Brazilian contract or whatnot. And I love the Brazilian guns. I love the the uh, Yugoslavian or the Czech guns. They're great, but. There's something about the original Mauser Obendorf guns. I would say the same thing for the DWN, D, excuse me, DWM, and the Louvre, the Louvre, Louvre, Louvre <laughs> guns as well. You know, there's just something about those original guns to me, and usually to a lot of collectors. Anywho, if you could, please comment, check out Patreon. Like, share, subscribe, all that would be great. With that, this is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.